taking over legal services. Many, many of the small uh, legal firms operating uh, in the, the high in the main street um, would be at risk because their more profitable work would go. Perhaps if you could do the you know the conveyance and uh, online are, are, are cheaper at the store. So I, 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 there are surely are clearly um, that you've said that there will be some risks. What are the risks to the consumer? Um, and, and Consumer Focus Scotland's opinion? Well, I think, I mean, yes, there's a risk that, that access to justice could be decreased. We don't actually believe that. As I've said, we think it's actually potentially could be increased by these changes. Um, I think, I mean, I think it's also important to, to be clear that we're still talking about solicitors providing legal services. You know, the head of legal service will have to be a solicitor. They're responsible for all the designated persons with, within that licensed legal services provider. So people will have the same protections that they have at the moment in terms of um, the legal services that are provided for them, the, 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 the level to which those should be provided, the quality of those services, and what happens if things go wrong. So in, in, I think that, that's sometimes lost in all of this, that actually we are talking about solicitors providing these services, it's just that they're being employed by different entities than they are at the moment. Perhaps tell the committee what, what is going wrong just now? Why is there the, the, the need for this uh, legislation? So what, what's going, going wrong with legal services at the moment? Well, I think, as I've already said, there are, there are clearly markets where there is insufficient supply. Um, some of that's in specific geographical areas, but we know that in particular areas of law, there is a, there is a dearth of provision. Um, things like social welfare law um, and family law is increasingly an issue in, in a lot of areas too. Um, I'll, I'll move on now, convener, to the, uh, the governance. And again, um, I, I think you've already touched on uh, on this as, as well. The um, particularly um, consumer focus Scotland um, have mentioned about the uh, benefits of uh, increased non-solicitor memberships of the, the Council of the Law Society. And I think that um, consumer focus Scotland wants to see that at 50 per cent, and the, the, the government are seeing that around about 20 per cent. Do you want to say any more than, than you've already said on that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I mean for us, this is absolutely key. We, we and the Scottish Consumer Council have argued for this for, for many years, and, and we think it's even more important, if we're going down this road, um, that there's public confidence um, in the professional body and the regulatory body. Um, we're very pleased that the Law Society is moving towards 50% lay representation on its regulatory committee, but we still have concerns that 20%, which is what it's proposing for its council, is insufficient, given its dual role to promote the profession's interest and the public interest. We think that should be, it should be more equal, that there should be 50% lay representation on the council too. Have you anything to, to add to these answers, eh, Ms Farmer? No, I think I've covered most of these points already. It, Thank you. you have indeed. It's just one thing occurs to me that uh, Unite is a very sizable, indeed substantial trade union. Uh, many of your um, uh, members will ask for advice and assistance. Uh, wh what do you do about legal services for them? Um, as a union, we deploy various firms of solicitors um, to give legal advice, um, to represent our members in, in court, at tribunals, and uh, we also have our own legal department with, within the union. But depending on the area, depending on the region, and depending on the, the nature of the legal um, query, we do deploy various firms of solicitors across the country. Specialists normally in employment law, but not necessarily. Yes, according to specialisation. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. Nigel Dodd. Thank you very much, Convener. If I could just come back, uh, probably to, to Ms O'Neill, on, on the issue of, <laughs> uh, of advocates um, and on the governance of, of the Faculty of Advocates, because Section 27 of your written uh, submission suggests that you support the self-regulation of advocates by the Faculty. Um, note that its governing arrangements could create confusion in the public's mind, which I'm sure is absolutely true because I'm quite sure that the general public have not the slightest idea how advocates work or even indeed what they do. Um, we then finish up by saying that you do not believe the current provisions within the bill offer sufficient clarity to allay our fears about the lack of independent oversight of the faculty. I'm just wondering if you could tell me what you would like to be done to change that, please. Mm. Um, well, our, our position is very clear. We think that the same should apply to the faculty as we say should apply to the Law Society, that there should be lay representation on 
the, the faculty's council that should be 50 percent there should be a lay chair and certainly you know we, we feel the faculty could be more transparent in how it actually does regulate advocates and while we welcome the fact that the regulatory arrangements are being put in statute it's still not entirely clear how those will operate and in what circumstances the court of session may delegate um, those powers to the lord president and or the faculty of advocates Accepting your point that there may be a lack of clarity, I suspect the whole of this will have a lack of clarity until we finally signed off the finished act. Um, are, are we not in a position to, to accept that advocates fundamentally work for the courts and therefore regulation by the Lord President, no doubt delegated on occasion, is a pretty good way to operate in practice? No, because advocates work on behalf of consumers, and it's very important that that's recognised in their regulation. Yes, they work for the courts, but, but you know, ultimately the, their clients are, are, are consumers who should be represented in, in the regulation. Do you not feel, given that they do in fact only respond to solicitors, with a few exceptions, which I think we discussed a couple of weeks back, is it not the solicitors who, in a sense, regulate the advocates on behalf of the client? Because if solicitors are not happy with what they're getting, they know exactly where to complain. Solicitors know where to complain, but certainly we, we are contacted from time to time by consumers who have used advocates with whom they are unhappy, and they're not entirely clear how they make a complaint about that, what the process is, how any of this is governed and regulated. And we see this as an opportunity to actually open that up and make it a lot clearer how, how all of that operates. So is it perhaps more about a transparent complaint system than actually a regulation system? We think it's about regulation more broadly. Um, I mean, complaints has been a particular issue and one that we've done a lot of work on in the past, particularly in relation to the solicitor branch of the profession. And we, we obviously have the, the commission now, which, which deals with complaints for both branches of the profession. But other, other issues in terms of regulation are also of interest to consumers in terms of how advocates and solicitors are educated and trained, um, what their professional standards are, and, and other things like that. And we think it's very important that that, that view should be represented in terms of the governing body. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Robert Brown. Thank you very much. Apologies, uh, convener, for coming in late with transport problems this morning slightly. A fairly consistent uh, problem in that direction. Yeah, yeah. Could I move on to a question, really, which I suppose implies the issue of um, professional qualification, which is the extent to which will writing should be regulated in Scotland? And ask Ms O'Neill in particular if she has a view on behalf of Consumer Focus Scotland about that aspect. Yes, we do. Um, I mean, we're, we're not, we, we haven't been made aware that there's a particular issue with will writing services in Scotland. We understand there, there are more of them appearing in Scotland now. I think traditionally it was more of an issue in England. But we certainly think that if will writers are providing services in Scotland, that they should be adequately regulated. Um, I mean, our, our view very much is that, um, you know, it may be okay for people to, to do it yourself or to use will writers if it's a very straightforward set of circumstances, but unfortunately people often think their circumstances are straightforward and they, they, in actuality they're not. So our view is very much that people should take legal advice before they prepare a will. But, yes. it, but these providers are in the market so that, that there should be adequate protection for consumers if they use those providers. Does this not perhaps raise the broader question which I think Fiona Farmer touched on earlier on about the, the balance between, if you like, the cost of the product and the quality of the service you get for it? Um, because I mean, as I understand it in terms of the explanation we've had about will writing services, um, these are very much do-it-yourself things, no guarantees, no professional indemnity, no... Um, no legal advice about the implications, a very complex area of the law, as, as you've touched on. Um, are there not quite significant issues that perhaps have implications beyond just the will writing category here in terms of where you know, quite strong professional quality is required in terms of the service provided? Well, I mean, we, we would always say that the, the professional who's prov providing a service should be appropriately qualified for that service, and that isn't necessarily always a solicitor. We know, for example, in relation to money advice, housing, other areas, there are a lot of non-solicitor advisors who are much better informed and, and more experienced than, than a number of solicitors. So I think it depends on what's appropriate for the particular service that's being provided. And I think this is a, it's an opportunity for the legal profession to actually, you know, brand itself and say, well, you should come to us, don't come to the writers, come 
come to us because we have that legal expertise and actually we don't, we don't actually charge that much for wills. I mean, I, th I think it's important that people have the information they need to make an informed choice about that. And to be clear, of course, as well, that solicitors often of, of, offer wills as a, a loss leader because they hope to then later get executory business. And it's important that people are aware of that when, when they actually take on those services. Is, is it appropriate that there should be the availability of a, a do-it-yourself service in that area at all? I mean, 